Hi guys, how's it going? Bol Liddell here of ImagesByBolin.com. Welcome to part 7 of my video series on exposure blending. In this video I'm going to build off the previous one in part 6 where I demonstrated the use of the magic wand tool and show you how to achieve selections for creating blending masks using what's known as the color range command which resides under the select menu. Sometimes this selection method works fabulously and better than either the magic wand or quick selection tools and at other times I find it performs poorly. Like the magic wand tool it enables pretty complex selections based on color and luminosity tones in the photo. But as with that method it can also require a lot of cleanup steps to finalize the mask. So let's get going. Okay so here we are back in Photoshop again uh, looking at that uh, Badlands photo once more and we're going to demonstrate the color range command which is located up here under the select menu so I'm gonna select color range and you'll see a dialog show up and usually it'll show up with uh, no selection preview so none will be showing here in the pop-up uh, box and you'll see a little mask um, if you have the selection radio button clicked or uh, the actual image I usually have uh, this shown so that I can see a bit of a mask and the color range enables you by the select drop down box up top to select either uh, various colors or color channels as well as luminosity regions such as highlights, midtones, and shadows and for those of you that do portrait work um, you can uh, select skin tones. Um, so at any rate usually um, I'm going to be using sampled colors um, although I'll show you a way in which you can use luminosity uh, channels there to uh, make some refined selections, albeit uh, not nearly as refined as what you can do with dedicated luminosity selections. Uh, now, I've got sampled colors selected, and uh, the localized color clusters uh, is a feature, if you have it checked, whereby it in, ess in essence enables you to uh, group more of the selection, similar to if you were checking the contiguous box using the magic wand tool. Um, it can, and in some cases, you know, maybe not be uh, a valuable method to use. Um, if you do have it selected, then your range slider over here um, provides you a little more latitude to select the range of tones. The fuzziness is basically just going to enable you to um, expand upon uh, the amount of area that is selected uh, based upon the colors that have been sampled. And uh, so you'll start out uh, with that tool selected and usually click once. And then from there on you can either go over here and select the plus tool or you can press shift while you do that. It just depends on your preference. And as you uh, begin to select colors, then they're going to start to show up uh, on your mask in the dialog box. And I usually have my fuzziness set somewhere between about 10 and 30. Um, and then I adjust these sliders um, after I've done some selection. So you can see after the initial selection, you have to have your range above zero. Um, but at any rate, uh, I can now press and hold down and drag that eyedropper tool over the entire area that I want to select. Those that aren't selected are still going to be shown in black, and so I can continue to target those areas. If I want a little more precision, then I'm going to, I tend to prefer a black map. So it's going to um, show black pixels in the areas that I don't want to show black pixels, and I'll continue to. Uh, scroll over that and after I'm done pressing it down it'll reapply that mask and so I can continue to go over those areas uh, until I've selected uh, more of that color range and depending on your settings it could take a little while to do and if you have a lot of different tones in the region that you want to try and select, it'll take longer. So you may have to drag your uh, eyedropper uh, quite a few times and over uh, many different portions of that image. And uh, then I can go over to the dialog box and I can adjust the fuzziness. That's going to show both in the mask as well uh, in the dialog box as well as on the screen in this case. 
and I'm trying to minimize the amount of deselected pixels in this case in the sky and uh, doesn't necessarily matter what happens in the foreground but I don't want any pixels to be or very many pixels to be selected along the edge boundary and then I can adjust the range and as I do that um, you can see the effects that are going to happen. Um, so when you're done making your selection, you basically load that as a selection by clicking OK. And you can see your marching ants. Now, uh, this is a much more complicated uh, selection process. There may be very partially selected pixels, much more so than even you would find with the magic wand. And you won't really ascertain that until you uh, look at a mask. And so you can see here that there were uh, quite a few pixels selected in the foreground, although it's manageable and it's far enough away from the edge boundary. Now I've zoomed into 200%, and you can see that there's a few stray pixels selected um, on the near side of the horizon, but there's also a lot of pixels select or deselected in the background, and we don't want that. Uh, so to get rid of that is going to require um, either going back and experimenting that much further with the, uh, you know, basically undoing what you just did and uh, experimenting again with the color range command to get it more refined. Or once you have a decent, in this case, edge selection along your boundary, then you'll need to use uh, brushing technique, particularly with the overlay mode on your brush, and uh, brush out those uh, lightly uh, deselected or majority selected but slightly deselected darker pixels on the white side of the edge and then vice versa on that uh, on the black side and so um, here's an example of another color range selection uh, that I did and uh, so I just simply inverted the mask so that the foreground uh, was selected and then here I've touched up all of those artifacts and I'll go ahead and load that as a selection and apply it to our light image. And you can see that uh, at this scale, uh, we've got a very similar to re result to what we had with the previous two auto selection tools. Here I'll just toggle on one of them uh, you know, to show you uh, what those look like. Um, And, you know, we get a very similar blend. Uh, the only difference here is I haven't applied this particular layer mask yet to my curves adjustment. Uh, now I should get a very similar blend. You see almost no difference here uh, when I toggle the quick selection or the magic wand tool. Uh, but if I zoom in to 100%, and we scrutinize this edge much more, uh, we're going to start seeing a few artifacts pop out at us. Right now I'm showing the quick selection blend version. Now here is the color range version. And you can see that in uh, throughout most of this boundary here, there's some pretty hard edges that simply don't show up. Now I'm showing the quick selection version. Okay, And so this mask is very hard. It's very hard edged and it creates many more edge artifacts. They're not terrible though and we can deal with those. We can correct them and I'm going to show, show you how to do that now. Uh, unlike the say portrait photography, unlike uh, professional image editors that might be working on a magazine cover or say you're You've taken a portrait of a model, and she has uh, very uh, fine hair, and you need to mask that and superimpose it over um, a background from a different photo. And the method that I'm going to show you to correct these edges uh, is really designed for those purposes. For landscape photography such as this, since we're typically um, not blending something that doesn't belong, with another photo and in this case we're double processing a single image or we've taken two or three uh, photos in rapid succession uh, because it's a high dynamic range scene um, we really have good uh, our, our images are lining up and we're not going to have many edge artifacts so these 
artifacts that are created are so small they're easy to fix. Um, and so this is a, a really neat feature in Photoshop. If the selection was still active, it'd be called Refine Edge. And when you're actually working on a mask, it's called Refine Mask. So you'll get another dialog box that uh, shows up here. And I almost always have the view selected to On Layers and then uh, click Remember Settings because if I don't have that selected, then every time I make a change, it's going to actually ignore the mask and show me the original image layer. And I have to use an X key or the drop down menu here to toggle it on and off. So I don't get to see the result uh, immediately. I have to wait a little bit. Um, so I'm going to have that mode selected for view and then I'm almost always going to have the smart radius box selected. And that's a really important feature in Photoshop. Over the years um, these refine edge um, and refine mask routines have been significantly updated to detect edges in a very smart way as well as different ways as I'm circling here uh, in the dialog box to smooth feather or shift the edge so that you can remove some of those edge artifacts. Generally speaking, I won't use any of those. Even decontaminate colors. I almost rarely, uh, almost never use the adjust edge or the output um, sections of the refine mask and refine edge command because, again, if uh, for the type of photography I do, I'm not going to be generating significant artifacts. I'm not superimposing, cutting and pasting an object into a completely different image. It's just not going to happen. So usually all I have to do is select Smart Radius and then adjust my radius by just, you know, a tenth or two um, of pixels. So if I go back down to uh, No Adjustment, um, you can see here that our, ed our hard edges have returned. Uh, but all I have to do is increase uh, to say a tenth of a pixel and you can see that I've already lost all those edges so I'm gonna circle this area right here and, and go back down to zero and you can see those hard edges I'm gonna go back to a tenth of a pixel radius now they're gone if I have some areas that still need a little bit uh, more help still look a little too uh, hard edge then I'll go up to maybe two tenths and I've almost never had to go up to about uh, say four tenths of a pixel uh, to get a sufficient blend. And now if I compare the two, uh, you know, the different images, I'll go ahead and uh, actually what I should do here is show you the actual mask. And notice what the Refine Edge did. Just by putting on Smart Radius, what it does is it, it helped the um, Photoshop actually expand the area with which it's going to detect the radius on and then it it blends or feathers slightly uh, that selection. If I zoom in a little bit more uh, you can see that there's some uh, slightly grayer or, or uh, slightly deselected some of that edge so it's it smoothed out that boundary and so I'm just going to go ahead and load this selection and apply it to my curves adjustment layer and I'm going to go back into 100% magnification, back up to that edge, and now we can compare uh, our quick selection blend. And yeah, you might see a couple very small areas where the selection was slightly different between the two methods, but for the most part, um, there's no difference. And we've recovered uh, the edge artifacts um, and made a nice smooth natural realistic looking blend we just don't want those hard edges those blocked up cut and paste type Photoshop looking uh, edges uh, so that's a really handy uh, feature and I uh, hope that if you're gonna use selections to do your blends that you explore the refine mask and the refine edge command because it's really gonna help you make more realistic blends now Here's a little bit different looking photo from what I've been showing you. It's not your typical landscape shot. It's more intimate. It's under a forest canopy. Uh, but it's another way that I can use the color range command. And if I do that here, there's another way, instead of sampling colors, uh, that I can go ahead and make these adjustments. I mentioned earlier that we can select highlights, such as I've selected here. Let me get rid of the black mask. 
I can select midtones and I can select shadows. And um, what I have to do is pay attention to the tones in the image that I want to sh show and those that I want to hide. And based upon whether I have my dark or my light image on top, make a decision about what mask I'm going to use. And sometimes um, it's actually the inverted mask that works well. In this particular case, I'm actually going to uh, make sure that the shadows are selected. And uh, then I'm going to adjust my fuzziness and my range. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that the light pixels on the dark image are going to show uh, because they've recovered the highlights. And uh, make sure that the uh, dark areas um, are not so that those corresponding areas in the lighter image and the underlying layer are showing through. So I don't want a whole lot to show through um, this part of the dark image. Um, so uh, I felt uh, when I experimented with this that the shadows did a sufficient job. But of course, I need those shadows selected right now. They're not. So I just simply invert that mask. And uh, then I can go ahead and create the selection. And then after I've done that, I'll, you'll see the marching ants. Uh, I can create a channel so that I've saved it. Here's an example of that. And then it's just a simple function of loading that selection uh, onto the layer and here I have an initial blend. Now you need to scrutinize at any time you do this because uh, there are um, you know it is prone to toning down the contrast but I can easily take a look at that mask, go back to my brush tool and alter this so that I can mask out and in the areas that I want. So if I want to tone down the areas in the dark image that are not nearly as good as that light image showing through, I can do that. I can use the mask like this, or I can go back to the image and continue to work on that. I'm not worried about blowing out too many highlights back in here. Now, what did I just do there? When I tone back and move back to the image layer, you don't want that. I've got to get back to my actual mask before I make these changes. So again, I can go through and do that. I can see here I'm getting that lighter layer showing through. I can focus on some of these dark regions and then I can also tone down maybe some of these highlights that didn't get toned down enough. So I've altered the mask a little bit, but in essence the real blend occurred using that color range command. And this, you couldn't have asked for a quicker way to initially blend this image. This isn't how I finally blended this image. I used luminosity masks. Um, but this, among a whole bunch of other uh, techniques that I've already demonstrated in previous videos, actually do a pretty good job of providing somewhat equivalent blend. So another way to experiment with the color range uh, command to uh, blend a couple photos together and uh, very quick and easy. And you don't really uh, end up generating very many artifacts in the process. Uh, you just have to worry about uh, toning down contrast too much. Now, uh, we're going to revisit this photo. Uh, we had some problems blending this uh, earlier, and we're going to try the color range command here as well. And so I'm going to go back to sampled colors, and in this case, I want a, you know, a, a relatively hard blend. And so I'm going to tone my fuzziness down I'm going to get rid of local uh, localized color clusters. Uh, probably just initially start with my fuzziness around 20 or so. And uh, I'm going to start uh, selecting colors uh, in this photo. And I'm going to make sure I do not have it inverted. And I'm just going to drag or first, first make a selection and then click Add to Selection, and then as we've done before, as you've seen before, I'm just going to drag over the photo, and then I'm going to apply my mask so I can see areas easily that haven't been selected so that I can drag over those. Then, as we did before with this photo, using the Magic Wand tool, I'm going to start to pixel peep just a little bit so I can be more precise. I'm going to look for these black fuzzy areas that have some deselected pixels. 
try and make more accurate selections here. So you see I can go around and be pretty precise with um, some of these selection techniques. And in a photo like this, there's a lot of detailed work to do. And I'm really needing to get into these highlights. I need to make sure that some of these highlight colors and tones uh, are selected. Otherwise, I know I'm going to have a lot of edge artifacts. So you can appreciate how much time really needs to be spent on uh, a photo like this and using a technique like this uh, to get a really good selection. If you spend enough time and do it right, uh, it can be pretty decent. Uh, but as I've alluded to and stated before, for other auto selection procedures, anytime you're relying on automated procedures, uh, chances are, you know, it's not going to perform quite as well. But we have a, a pretty decent initial selection, at least by the looks of it. So I can load that, um, go ahead and take a look at what that mask looks like, and we can invert that mask. And you can see there's very few deselected pixels in the in the foreground. I can go ahead and zoom into this uh, mask, and you see uh, we've got a few areas here that... Uh, you know there might be some issues but these are not in the portions of the region or uh, regions of the image that we have a lot to worry about um, all in all we have a much better selection here granted they're pretty hard boundaries that's the problem with these auto selection techniques but we don't have nearly as much indication that we're going to have edge artifacts like we had with the magic wand tool okay so I'm gonna go back up here and find uh, one I worked on previously, essentially the identical uh, mask. Apply that to our image. And then I'm also going to enable the top uh, layer here and its layer mask, which is just a manual blend to blend in the uh, light tones in the foreground. And we have a pretty decent looking image. Again, we're going to need to pixel peep this to scrutinize a little bit further. And immediately you can see there are still some edge artifacts here. Uh, overall, we have fewer than we did when we used the magic wand tool. Uh, but they're, they're still there and depending upon your output needs uh, they may well be unacceptable and this is probably the worst part of the image uh, this region here has a lot of edge artifacts and it is unacceptable but uh, I can use the refine edge uh, and or refine mask um, routine and I won't go through that again here for the sake of time I'll just load one that I already worked on and apply that and then we'll zoom back into some of these same regions and you can see here that the edge artifacts we had before and this was only 0.2 pixels of a smart radius application and you can see that uh, we more or less got rid of 90 percent of those edge artifacts we had a lot of them here and along these thin branches there's still some artifacts right here. And we might want to consider, if not using a luminosity mask, at least a soft edge, edge brush to work on that. Uh, but we did deal with a lot, you know, 90% of the edge artifacts here. So I'm, I'm, th I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, now, when I get over to this bad region again, I'm still not quite happy with this. So I either need to apply a luminosity mask and paint it into this region, use a brush, um, and if I show you right here what the luminosity mask looks like, so I did nothing but apply the actual luminosity uh, mask. It was a uh, darks, a shadow darks mask um, that I'll show you right here. Um, so I applied the full mask. I didn't paint it in. And the one reason why these luminosity selections and masks work so well is they're, they're highly selective and they're self-feathering, which is key. So all I did was alter this mask a little bit by toning down uh, uh, that area there. And uh, my end result was, you know, was this blend. And it's far better than the blend here with the color range uh, selection. However, compared to all the other methods that I've shown you with this photo, the color range still does a pretty decent job. So one final image here. We've seen this again uh, many times and I can use the uh, color range 
to do a selection here just like I did with the magic wand tool um, and I get something like this that looks somewhat similar to a luminosity selection but not quite and so clearly there's a lot of cleanup to do here so a color range selection oftentimes will give you these types of results it just depends on the image and there's a lot of different tones throughout uh, different portions of this image so it wasn't really straightforward to uh, hone in on that uh, horizon edge that I needed to but it did a reasonable job nevertheless I've got to do some uh, significant cleanup here and if I do that um, I can get a really uh, good edge result like this and when I blend that together here's my result and certainly at this scale it looks good um, I'm fairly happy with that I can zoom in here to 100% and we can inspect how this blend performed. You can see we still have some issues right here. And through most of this we're doing pretty good. There might be a couple artifacts here. They're minor. Um, the color range doesn't do as well as the magic wand in this case from about this portion of the uh, edge of the volcano all the way up along the ridge. And if we go over here, we can see there's more edge artifacts on what's known as Barrier Peak. And uh, you can see some edge artifacts around uh, the tree. Now, they're not terrible, and those are all easily corrected using the Refine Edge uh, command. And then, uh, as I showed, using Luminosity Edge Selection Masking, uh, we have these blown-out highlights here, just as we did with the... Um, magic wand selection and we have these darker tones that need to be lightened a little bit to balance the image appropriately um, so we can we can get a decent result that's going to be almost identical to luminosity selections but in the end we actually have to spend a little bit more time and effort versus this version that I'll now show you here's the luminosity blend uh, where we get absolutely uh, perfect blending on our edges um, self-feathering, nice uh, natural edges throughout the entire portion that we're targeting and uh, really easy to deal with the dark areas in the mountain and the highlights in the uh, along the ridge in the snow fields and tone them back down. Uh, so it kind of begs the question of why not use luminosity mass and selections to begin with. Uh, they're more refined they're self-feathering so they enable you to make better uh, and perfect selections almost every time. Uh, so be that as it may, as you can see we can still use auto selection methods to eventually get reasonable blending masks and you might find time when these uh, options will perform very well for you especially if you don't want to take the time to learn how to create luminosity selections and masks uh, so to each his own. With that I'll bring this video to a close. I hope You've learned something that you can use in your own post-processing workflow. If you have any questions, you can visit my webpage or send me an email at the link shown in the more info section below this video and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Stay tuned for the next video in this series while I'll sh where I'll show you a couple other generally little known features within Photoshop that are often used by professionals in the graphic design world uh, that you should be aware of and might find useful under some situations to blend multiple exposures. Okay, happy trails, guys.